last three parables in this series of seven form a group in themselves. After the Lord spoke the parable of the leaven, he dismissed the multitude and took his disciples into the house. Now, if you can remember the opening of our chapter, the 13th, we have the statement, the same day went Jesus out of the house and sat by the seaside. Verse 1. When he finished teaching the first four parables, he sent the multitude away and returned to the house with the disciples. Notice verse 36. Then Jesus sent the multitude away and went into the house, and his disciples came unto him. All right, you have then a scene changing. When he finished teaching the first four parables, he dismissed the multitude and gets together with the disciples only. Now, it is significant, I think, that these last three parables were given to the disciples only. The multitudes were mere casual hearers of what Christ taught. They were spectators only as he spoke those first four parables. Now, in the three remaining parables, he will minister to those who truly and sincerely believed in him. He now will reveal to his own what God is doing during that period between the first and second advents of Christ to the earth. In the first four parables, Satan is at work. But here, the work of God is stressed. And right here, we take courage. Now, there's a close similarity between the fifth and sixth parables. They both have something in common. I want to read them together so as to see how they are alike. And then we'll study them separately as individual parables. Now, watch now as I read the two parables, verses 44 and 45. Again the kingdom of heaven is like unto treasure hid in a field, the which when a man hath found, he hideth, and for joy thereof goeth, and selleth all that he hath, and buyeth that field. Again the kingdom of heaven is like unto a merchant man seeking goodly pearls. In both parables there is a man. In both parables he finds something he wants, and in both he sells all that he has to buy them. Now there are certain parts of these parables with which we are already familiar. First, there's a field. There's no difficulty here, because look at verse 38. The field is the world. Jesus made that clear. Secondly, there's a man in the story. And again, there is no difficulty. Look at verse 37. The man is the son of man. Then there's a hidden treasure and a costly pearl that Christ the man wants. They are in the human race. They are in the world of humanity. What is this treasure, and how does he acquire it? Before we proceed to examine the scriptures, I must say that I am opposed to one of the popular interpretations of these two parables, which teaches that the treasure and the pearl represent salvation in Christ or Christ himself. The man in the parables is said to be the sinner who goes about seeking Christ. When he discovers him, then he must sell all that he has, give it all up, and purchase Christ at any cost. But my friends, this whole idea is false. Christ is not hidden somewhere in the world, nor is he for sale. Moreover, it is not the sinner who seeks Christ, it is Christ who seeks the sinner. Luke 19.10 For the Son of Man is come to seek and to save that which was lost. The sinner has nothing to offer Christ in exchange for salvation. Why, without Christ, he is in a state of bankruptcy. Neither Christ nor salvation are the treasure in this parable. What is the treasure? The answer is in the Bible. Three months after the children of Israel had left Egypt and had come to the desert of Sinai, God gave this message to Moses. Psalm, or rather, Exodus chapter 19, verse 3. Listen carefully. Tell the children of Israel, Now, therefore... If ye will obey my voice indeed, and keep my covenant, then shall ye be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people. Exodus 19, 3-5. Then Psalm 135, verse 4. For the Lord hath chosen Jacob for himself, and Israel for his peculiar treasure. When God chose Israel to become his treasure, it was not because they were better than other nations. God wanted the people to represent him to be the repository for his word, and to be an example of what a nation ought to be. God intended Israel to show to the rest of the world how any nation can be blessed with peace and prosperity 
through a right relationship to himself. This was a great honor and a privilege for Israel. However, it enjoined upon Israel a solemn responsibility. Israel was not to be God's treasure in name only, but they were to be a holy people before all the other nations of the world. Moses wrote in Deuteronomy chapter 7, beginning with verse 6, For thou art an holy people unto the Lord thy God. The Lord thy God hath chosen thee to be a special people unto himself, above all people that are upon the face of the earth. The Lord did not set his love upon you, nor choose you, because you were more in number than any people, for you were the fewest of all people, but because the Lord loved you, and because he would keep the oath which he had sworn unto your fathers, hath the Lord brought you out with a mighty hand, and redeemed you out of the house of bondmen from the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. When God called Abraham, he promised to bring forth a great nation and bless the people. And then he added this in Genesis chapter 12, Thou shalt be a blessing, and in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. Israel was to be a witness to God's grace and power. Israel was to reflect the glory of God among all nations. Now in this parable, Israel is his treasure. However, when Christ came, the nation was no longer a shining example of what a people in fellowship with God should be. For more than 700 years, Israel had been the military target of other nations. The people had violated God's laws and become involved in various forms of idolatry. As a result of their backsliding, God allowed them to suffer defeat at the hands of their enemies. When the Lord Jesus Christ appeared in his first coming, his treasure was hidden. That is, the people were scattered without a king. A remnant that returned from their latest captivity was then chafing under the bitter yoke of Rome. God's treasure had failed to fulfill his role. The 400 years between the two testaments are often called the silent years because there was no contact between God and his treasure, not even a prophet to speak to the people for God. Where was the treasure? They were dispersed among the Gentiles, John 7:35. James wrote to the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad, James 1.1. 1, 1. Peter likewise addressed his first epistle to the strangers scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, 1 Peter 1.1. 1, 1. When the Son of Man came to earth, his treasure was hid in a field, scattered throughout the known world. Israel as a nation was lost to the world as an influence for God. And when the man came, the treasure was his first objective. John said he came unto his own, John 1.11. When Jesus commissioned his twelve disciples, he said, Go not into the way of the Gentiles, and unto any city of the Samaritans enter ye not, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, Matthew 10, verses 5 and 6. Why did he say that? He was seeking his treasure. After Pentecost, Peter said to the Jews, Unto you first... God, having raised up his son Jesus, sent him to bless you, to you first, Acts 3.26. Even Paul was aware of the fact that Israel was God's treasure when he said to the Jews, it was necessary that the word of God should first have been spoken to you, Acts 13.46. In his epistle to the Romans, the great apostle Paul testified to his justifiable pride in the gospel because it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth to the Jew first, Romans 1.16. Yes, Israel, God's treasure, was the chief concern of the Lord Jesus Christ when he came to earth the first time. He came unto his own. He found the treasure. But John 1.12 says, His own received him not. They failed to recognize in Jesus their promised Messiah and Deliverer. And as we saw earlier in our study, Israel's leaders rejected him, so he turned from them and hid the treasure again. The parable says the kingdom of heaven is like unto treasure hid in the field, the which when a man hath found, he hideth. Yes, he uncovered his treasure, but only for a brief period of time. When they said they would not have him, and openly rejected him, he hid the treasure again. And his opposition mounted against our Lord. He withdrew from the nation of Israel, saying, The kingdom of God shall be taken from you, and given to a nation bringing forth the fruits thereof, Matthew 21:43. He was telling them that the privilege of showing forth the grace and glory of God would be taken from them, and that now they would go back into hiding. But God will not leave himself without a witness. If Israel, his treasure, 
refuses to obey him, he's going to find another, a pearl. A pearl who will become his mouthpiece during his absence from the earth. When Christ found his treasure, he was giving Israel another opportunity to appear as the leading nation among the other nations of the world. But Israel forfeited the opportunity. But Christ did not give up on Israel. After he found the treasure and hid it again, we read, For joy thereof goeth and selleth all that he hath. I am pressing the point that he did not obtain the treasure until after he sold all that he had. The man who with his joy goes and sells all that he has is none other than the Lord Jesus Christ. It was on the cross that he gave all himself. Galatians 2.20 Who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Hebrews 12.2 And what was the joy set before him? It was the joy of knowing that in the Father's will he was paying the purchase price to redeem his treasure. Oh, what condescending love! He sold all that he had. Paul expressed it this way in Philippians 2 who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself, and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Philippians 2, verses 6 through 8. Again he wrote in his second epistle to the Corinthians, for as much as ye know that ye were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. 1 Peter 1, 18 and 19. And again he wrote, For ye know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that ye through his poverty might be rich. The final verse is Paul's word, in 2 Corinthians 8, 9. Yes, Christ gave all that he had. Now the parable does not tell all the story about Israel's future. We know that the treasure, though hidden today, will one day be under the control of its creator and redeemer. The future for Israel is bright with prospect. Israel is to be a witness to the world of the grace and power of her Messiah and redeemer. The application of this parable goes beyond that first advent of Christ to the earth, looking ahead to his second coming. Paul dealt with this subject fully in his epistle to the Romans in chapters 9 through 11. These three chapters, Romans 9, 10, and 11, should be read at one sitting, because in them you will find a detailed explanation of the parable of the hidden treasure. In chapter 9, God's past selection of Israel is seen. In Romans chapter 10, God's present suspension of Israel. In chapter 10 of Romans, the nation is hidden. But in chapter 11 of Romans, God's prospect of salvation of Israel when Christ comes back again. These three chapters in Romans are a vital and an integral part of the epistle and absolutely essential to its correct interpretation. In chapter 9, Paul's dealing with the past history of Israel as a nation. God in his own sovereign will and purpose selected this people as his treasure. And Paul asked the question in Romans 9, 14, What shall we say then? Is there unrighteousness with God? God forbid. Was God unjust in choosing one nation above others as his treasure? The answer is a resounding no. Perish the thought. Don't allow it to even enter your mind. There is never injustice in the choices of God. If we can't trust God, in the matter of choosing and selecting, then whom can we trust? Because God chose Israel, envy, jealousy, and hatred have been aimed at the Jew. Many Gentiles do not approve of God's choice, but then, my friend, God being sovereign and righteous never did submit his choice of Israel for a Gentile vote of confidence. Yes, Israel is God's treasure. Man must leave God to his sovereign, righteous choices, or else we must all perish. Now, in Romans chapter 10, we learn why the treasure is hidden during this present dispensation. The chapter opens with a cry from Paul's heart in which he expresses the longing of his heart for Israel's salvation. That's in Romans 10.1. Their present situation 
one in which God is not now dealing with the nation, is due to their own failure. Paul said in Romans 10:2, they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. Where did Israel fail? Well, Romans 10:3, for they being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. You see, they were not ignorant of the law, for they practically worshipped it. They were ignorant of the righteousness of God described in Romans 3.21, a righteousness which is apart from the law. Divine righteousness and human righteousness are mutually exclusive. Isaiah gave a fitting description of all human righteousness when he said, All our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. Isaiah 64.6 Paul had learned the difference between these two kind of righteousness when he testified in Philippians 3.9, not having my own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. Self-righteousness erects a monument to the glory of God. God's righteousness, which is imputed to the sinner who trusts the finished work of Christ, always glorifies God. 1 Corinthians 1, verses 30 and 31. But of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God is made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption, that according as it is written, he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. Jesus had warned the Jews in Matthew 5.20, For I say unto you, that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, ye shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. But they rejected Christ. And so Paul said in Romans 10.16, they have not all obeyed the gospel. You see, Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth, Romans 10.4. But Israel would not submit to him. They would not accept him. It was not because they could not believe in him, but because they would not. And so, in this present dispensation, there is no difference between the Jew and the Gentile, Romans 10.12. Both are on the same standing as sinners before God, salvation being offered to both on the same basis. Israel, the treasure, is hidden today in the sense that God is not now dealing exclusively with that nation. Now we come to Romans chapter 11. Here we have a clear presentation of God's future purpose for his treasure, Israel. A remnant will be regathered and redeemed as a nation. The treasure, though hidden now, is not lost. God has not permanently rejected the Jew. All of his promises to Israel in the Old Testament will have a literal fulfillment. Now, there are some theologians who have no place in their theological system for Israel's future salvation. But what does the Bible teach? Romans 11.1 1, Hath God cast away his people? God forbid. Romans 11.2 God hath not cast away his people. Look at Romans 11.5. Even so, at this present time also, there is a remnant according to the election of grace. Paul, when he wrote the epistle, was in that remnant. God still calls them his people. And so you read in Romans 11.26 and 27, And so all Israel shall be saved. As it is written, There shall come out of Zion the deliverer, and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. For this is my covenant unto them, when I shall take away their sins. Now, presently, Israel remains in a state of spiritual blindness, but her tragic state of affairs will not last forever. The present unbelief of the nation has not resulted in the canceling of God's ancient promises. Paul's point-blank denial that God hath not cast off his people has reference to Israel as a nation. The Old Testament prophets predicted the continuity of Israel as the treasure of Jehovah, Read Jeremiah chapter 33, verses 23 through 26. The same divine grace that saved Paul and many other Jews will function in the future to restore the treasure, Israel, back into the favor of God. Here in Romans 11, the apostle is teaching that the present hardening of Israel against the Messiah is only temporary. Look at verse 25. That blindness in part is happened to Israel until the fullness of of the Gentiles be come in. And then, verse 26, all Israel shall be saved. 
there is a striking similarity between the events in Romans 11 and the events outlined by Christ in the 21st chapter of Luke. You should read Romans 11 alongside of Luke 21. In each passage, there is a designated time period called the Times of the Gentiles, Luke 21:24 and Romans 11:25. This period is the present age during which God is visiting the Gentiles to take from among them a people for his name, Acts 15, 14. Now, during this time, Israel is in the background. The treasure is hidden. Then in each of the two passages, Luke 21 and Romans 11, that time period closes with Israel being restored to the favor of God. In Luke, we read of Israel's redemption, when the Son of Man comes with power and great glory, Luke 21, 27 and 28. In Romans 11, Paul says that Israel shall be saved when? When there shall come out of Zion the Deliverer, and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob, Romans 11:26. You see, both are speaking of the same time period. Even though Israel is presently the enemy of Christ and his gospel, that nation is still God's treasure. It is still his elect nation. This is one of those mysteries of the kingdom given by our Lord in the parable recorded in Matthew 13, and of which Paul said, I would not, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, Romans 11.25. God's gifts to Israel are not to be recalled, Romans 11.29. God made a promise to Abraham, to Isaac, to Jacob, and to David, and God will never repent of those promises. Now, there's one pertinent thought in the parable that calls for comment. It is in our Lord's statement that he buyeth the field. Please note that in verse 44. Now we know that the field is the world, Matthew 13, 38. So when Christ gave his all in sacrificial death at Calvary, he died for the whole world of mankind. The Bible does not teach limited atonement. Nowhere does scripture place limitation on the atoning death of the Lord Jesus Christ. I think we have a great discussion today among Christians which is really fracturing the fellowship of God's people on this unscriptural teaching of limited atonement. It's not merely extra scriptural, it is unscriptural. Namely, that Christ died only for those whom he knew would be saved. My friends, the Bible does not teach that. In Romans 3.22 we read, Unto all and upon all them that believe, for there is no difference. Now, if you open your Bible and pay particular attention to those phrases, unto all and upon all. Have you ever wondered why Paul said unto all and upon all? Very simple. Unto all means that the righteousness of God is universal, available to every person on earth. It is for everybody. If it is unto all, then why aren't all saved? Well, there's a condition involved. It is upon all them that believe. Salvation is for all men if they want it, but it only rests upon those who believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Peter wrote about the false prophets and false teachers who privily shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them, and bring upon themselves swift destruction. 2 Peter 2.1 Notice in 2 Peter 2.1, that they were a part of that field that Christ bought, you see. And their destruction they brought upon themselves. John wrote of our Lord that he is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. 1 John 2, 2. And my dear friend, in closing, let me say that you are a part of that world whom God loves and for whom Christ died. When our Lord gave his life on the cross to buy the field, you were included in the purchase. The field is the world. Now, if you deny the Lord, then you bring upon yourself swift destruction. If you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, God will both justify you and make you righteous. Now, having seen that Christ bought the field, which is the world of humanity, we're now prepared to grasp the meaning of the next parable, the pearl of great price. Now, you'll see how these two parables are very closely related. So as we conclude this study, let me remind you that you are among those for whom the Lord Jesus Christ died. And I'll add this. If you, my friend, 
were the only sinner on the earth. When Christ came into this world, he would have died for you. And if I were the only sinner on the earth when he came, he would have died for me. Yes, he died for all. If you, if you have never trusted him, do so at once. And may God help you to make that decision.